Mabuhay! Ako po si Catriona Gray, Miss Universe 2018 and NCCA Arts Ambassador. My love for Philippine culture and the arts was not something that I was born with due to my mixed heritage. It was something that was grown, learned, and embodied. And I have fervent hope that we can continue to instill love and passion for Philippine arts and culture in each of us, especially among the second and third generation of Filipinos who are physically distant from their roots. For this, I would like to invite everyone to get to know more about our rich heritage through Centro Rizal, our cultural centers dedicated for the global promotion of Philippine culture, arts, and languages. To date, we have 35 centers across the globe. Visit the NCCA website and Centro Rizal Instagram to know more about their activities. Centro Rizal, Centro ng Filipino. Taloy pa kayo! True or false? The Philippines was discovered by Ferdinand Magellan in 1521. Answer? False. The Philippines was not discovered by Magellan. Groups of pre-Hispanic indigenous peoples had settled various parts of the country, and indigenous cultures had already been flourishing well before the 15th century. Indigenous women spent hours thinking up complex and meaningful textile patterns. The Mangyan were already creating ambahan, or poetry, usually etched on bamboo. The Kankanae buried their dead in hanging coffins to bring them closer to the sky, or God. This was the rich tapestry that, in a series of colonizations, Spain and America would dramatically change. Filipinos rallied against these powers, drawing upon a blossoming sense of nation. Like its iconic dessert, Halo Halo, Filipino identity is not just one thing, but a fascinating union of traditions, cultures, and influences. For Filipinos abroad hungry to know more about their roots and identity, Centro Rizal is the best place to start. Often located in Philippine embassies, Centro Rizal is the Philippines' cultural center abroad. There are over 30 sites of Centro Rizal across the world. Centro Rizal offers a treasure trove of Filipiniana and holds activities that celebrate Philippine culture. It has training courses for volunteer teachers and lessons and books on rules and writing and spelling in the Filipino language. Centro Rizal also has books and multimedia materials about Filipino culture and arts. Learn more about the People Power Revolution a model of nonviolent regime change that other nations have emulated, or how Filipinos used egg whites mixed with lime as mortar for large stone blocks to build massive churches. Centro Rizal also organizes cultural and educational activities such as lectures, film showings, exhibits, performances, food festivals, and workshops. Centro Rizal's doors are also open to foreigners who are interested to know more about the Philippines, including its trade and tourism opportunities. The center is named for Philippine hero Dr. Jose Rizal, whose books No Limitangere and El Filibusterismo helped spark the Philippine revolution against Spain. Rizal lived abroad for many years, but distance only fanned the flame of his love for country. Filipinos, like Rizal, can remain Filipino at heart, even as they make their home in other parts of the world. By keeping alive the ties of Filipinos overseas to their culture, Centro Rizal helps preserve the fabric of Philippine society. Visit Centro Rizal today to learn more about the Philippines and embrace your Filipino roots. Good Thursday evening from everyone in San Francisco and um, good Friday morning for those joining us in Manila. 
I am Vanessa Bagolona, Consul at the Philippine Consulate General in San Francisco. Welcome to our webinar, Rizal in San Francisco, Connections in Philippines U.S. History, with Dr. Ambeth Ocampo as our resource speaker. This virtual event is brought to you by the Central Rizal in San Francisco, which is the cultural arm of the Philippine Consulate General here in San Francisco. We are able to do this with the valuable support of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. This event is one of the projects that we are doing this year in celebration of the 75th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the Philippines and the United States. Some house rules for our webinar. We'd like to remind everyone joining us that your videos are disabled and only the speaker's videos can be seen online. We are also streaming live now on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com phnsf. This webinar is being recorded as um, you can see and we can share it to others later on. While your microphones are muted, um, you may send your questions through the chat box or you may post your questions on our Facebook page in the comment section and we'll read it so our resource person can respond. Thank you, and at this point, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Honorable Neil Frank R. Ferrer is the Consul General of the Philippines in San Francisco, which has consular jurisdiction over Alaska, Colorado, Idaho, Montana, Northern California, Northern Nevada, Oregon, Utah, Washington State, and Wyoming. Consul General Ferrer is a career diplomat with extensive experience in the foreign service, including consular work, bilateral and multilateral diplomacy. He has served in various capacities at the Philippine embassies in Beijing, London, and Ottawa. He is also, or he served as Philippine Consul General in Vancouver, Canada from 2013 to 2018. Consul General Ferrer is a recipient of a distinguished award for Filipino diplomats, the Gawad Mabini, with the rank of Dakilang Kamano Grand Cross, conferred by the President of the Republic of the Philippines on June 29, 2010. He began his tour of duty as Consul General here in San Francisco on January 20, 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Consul General Ferrer for his remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Consul Vanessa. Dr. Ambet R. Ocampo, our research person for today's webinar, Rizal in San Francisco, Connections in Philippines, U.S. History, members of the Filipino American community, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to everyone in San Francisco and across the United States, and good morning to those joining us in Manila. I hope that everyone is keeping safe and healthy at this time. On behalf of the Philippine Consulate General and Central Rizal San Francisco, I would like to warmly welcome all of you to our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to thank especially Dr. Ambet Ocampo for his time and preparations for this important online event. We are fortunate to have you at this webinar. You have made learning about Philippine history interesting, not only to students of history, but the public at large. Thank you so much for all the scholarly works you have done, especially as regards our national hero, Dr. Jose Rizal. We are also grateful to the National Commission for Culture and the Arts for its valuable support to this event and to the Central Rizal San Francisco. As the title of our event suggests, we expect to know about connections in Philippine US history that we may not be aware of or that we may be aware of, but about which we can make better sense of. With more than half a million Filipinos in the San Francisco Bay Area, and more than a million Filipinos in other states across our consular jurisdiction, we deem it necessary for us to connect the dots, so to speak, and learn from our shared histories. It is also important to do this as we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and the Philippines. For a start, the Philippine Consulate General in San Francisco was established immediately upon gaining Philippine independence from the United States in 1946. Our history is also largely tied to the Pacific War that saw Filipinos and Americans fighting side by side against a common adversary. We are also strategically located at the heart of downtown San Francisco, which is a stone's throw away from the Union Square where the Dewey Monument is located. 
We are also celebrating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month this May. And it is noteworthy to make connections in our histories and cultures as we face the all important issue of stemming the tide of anti-Asian sentiments, especially in the context of the current COVID-19 pandemic. This brings me to a historical fact that got us all thinking about making connections in the larger history of Philippines-US relations. When I arrived in January, one of the pieces of information I learned was that 10 minutes away from the Consulate General is the historic Palace Hotel where our national hero, Dr. Jose Rizal, stayed from May 4 to 6, 1888, during his only visit to the United States. Today, one can see a marker commemorating this event on the hotel's exterior wall. I hope that in your next visit to the Consulate General in San Francisco, you will remember the close relations between the Philippines and the United States and the moments in our history like that of our national hero's stay in San Francisco and his travel to other parts of the, United, of the United States that are still relevant to this day and age. Once again, thank you for joining us today and let's enjoy this webinar. Maraming salamat po, mabuhay. Thank you, Consul General Neil Ferrer. Our main speaker for this event is Dr. Ambeth R. Ocampo. He is a public historian whose research covers 19th century Philippines, its art, culture, and the people who figure in the birth of the nation. He is a full professor and former chair of the Department of History of the Ateneo de Manila University. And he has held previous teaching appointments at the University of the Philippines in Diliman, De La Salle University, San Beda University, and Sofia University in Tokyo, Japan. He was a visiting research fellow at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, Thailand, and at Kyoto University in Japan. In his lucid moments, he writes an editorial page column on history for the Philippine Daily Inquirer, and he has published over 35 books, the most recent being Looking Back 15, Martial Law by Anvil in 2020, and Yaman, History and Heritage in Philippine Money, for the Banco Central ng Pilipinas in 2021. He moderates growing Facebook and Instagram pages. In another time, another life, he spent time in a Benedictine monastery. He also served as president of the City College of Manila and as co-chair with Filipino journalist, historian, and author, Ms. Carmen Guerrero Nakpil at the Manila Historical and Heritage Commission, after which he moved on to be the president of the Philippine Historical Association and chairman of the National Historical Commission of the Philippines while he served as the concurrent chairman of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ambeth R. Ocampo, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope uh, you can hear me. I will uh, share my screen um, now. Um, okay. Hope it is working. Thank you very much again to the um, Philippine Consulate in San Francisco. In 2019, on my last um, Central Rizal tour, uh, I was in I was in Europe and uh, I did a Canada East Coast uh, lecture series, and I was hoping that I would be able to go to the West Coast and visit the consulate again. But the pandemic uh, brought us. Uh, into this mode of uh, communication. And I'm glad that even if we are uh, miles apart, half the world away, uh, we can still uh, be able to communicate through, through Zoom and Facebook. So uh, before, before I start, I just want to uh, give a few, uh, what's this, uh, advertisements. One is uh, that I hope you can follow me on Instagram or on Facebook. And uh, if you have friends in the Philippines, uh, that I hope you can also buy uh, some of my books, uh, the most popular being Rizal Without the Overcoat, which is uh, has been in print for the past 31 years. Now, today we're going to talk about Rizal, because in 2021, we commemorate the 160th anniversary of Jose Rizal's birth, the 125th anniversary of his death. And one wonders whether Philippine, a Filipino who lived so long ago can still be relevant to us today. 
uh, we are so used to Rizal. Uh, the picture that you have on the left is his most famous picture. It is the picture on which the Luneta monument has been um, fashioned. And uh, one wonders, you know, when we think of Rizal, we always think, you know, like history, it is old and it is irrelevant. But uh, I have researched during the pandemic. And during the pandemic, I was able to even do uh, play with this app that could actually make an old archival um, an old archival photograph move so it's a bit it's a bit eerie uh, to see Rizal moving closing his eyes smiling I haven't tried this on my Lola yet because uh, it's it's too personal to try but with Rizal it was quite good and um, it's a bit it's a bit crazy because the next step from this was that you, you are actually able to put your face into Rizal's, uh, or you can put someone else's face into Rizal's. So this is Senator Pacquiao in, in Rizal's face. So uh, the, the, we are able to do, look at history in new ways, but we are also challenged because now with this technology, you will be able to create deep fakes or fake news. Uh, that may, means that in, the, in our times, we have more need of critical thinking. Now, we should ask ourselves at the beginning of this webinar, why are most Filipino heroes male, old, and dead? Are heroes and heroism old? Is history irrelevant? Do we still have heroes today? I'd like to think that we still have heroes today, but they come in a different form and shape. So would you want to remember Rizal uh, today as this man in this archival photograph, or do you want to still have the same Rizal, but you will have him with spiked hair, better glasses, and a better suit? So the point here is that we have to look back in our history so that we can deal with the present and look forward to the future. But by doing that, most of the time I realize in my 30 years of teaching that many Filipinos have lost their appreciation for useless information. For example, it is not very well known that Manila and San Francisco are sister cities. And uh, in 1986, I, I, I was here when they, when they signed this agreement. Uh, it was then Mayor Feinstein, who's now in the Senate. And when I thought about this, you, most people have relatives in San Francisco, but they do not realize that the cities share a, uh, not only people, but also a shared history. Conjen has mentioned um, that in the in Union Square, there is the Dewey Monument, which today again is, is a bit controversial. There are some people who say America should not look back into their imperial past and maybe we should get rid of this. But I'd like to think that good or bad history is there to remind us. Uh, so we should not cancel it, but we should learn to appreciate it more. Um, the magic of history is not in learning, you know, all the names, dates, uh, events. What is important in history, the magic of history is actually finding connections between disjointed things. Um, in Union Square, when I used to go to San Francisco, I mean, my family, they're great shoppers. Um, we would usually start from Union Square and they'll say, you know, in three hours, let's meet here in the monument and everyone runs off. I mean, there used to be, there used to be a big bookstore on Union Square. So that's the only place where I would go. And afterwards, I would just stroll around uh, the square. And I did realize... Um, much until I was much older uh, when I had nothing better to do and nobody, people were late. So I read the text on the marker and I was very surprised that at the base of the, of the Union Square Dewey Monument, you find out that, you know, it was the groundbreaking was, was by William McKinley. It was dedicated by Theodore Roosevelt. And you see that this actually talks about the Battle of Manila Bay. So when you go around the monument, you will not only remember George Dewey, but you will also know the names of the ships that uh, fought in Manila Bay. Um, to give you an idea of what 
Davis flagship look like. This is the Olympia. And then if you go around the, the monument, you will see first the Secretary of the Navy's um, telegram to George Dewey saying you should go to the Philippines and destroy the Spanish fleet. Then there is a short narrative of uh, how on the night of April 30th, 1898, Dewey's squadron entered Manila Bay. And on May 1, they um, met the fleet of the Spanish Admiral Montojo. Uh, Montojo happens to be a, an ancestor of the present Sobel Ayala family. And uh, this was his flagship, uh, very proud flagship, the Reina Cristina. And this is what it looked like after the battle. Now, when I was in college, I was told that if you compare uh, the two navies that were there, uh, Spain had two protected cruisers, five unprotected cruisers. All of their fleet was sunk. And the U.S. only had one ship that was damaged. But what was important in this uh, is the only thing I remember from this lesson in my college life was that if you look at the fatalities, the Spanish lost 161 people. They had 210 wounded. In the U.S. only had one fatality, and my teacher used to say he died of heat stroke, not of the fighting, and there were nine wounded. But what is the importance or the relevance of the Dewey Monument? It should remind you that in 1898, the first shot in the Spanish-American War did not happen anywhere near Madrid or Washington. It happened half the world away in Manila Bay. And the end of that war, uh, is also connected to the history of San Francisco. If you go up to the Presidio, you will find that many veterans of the Philippine-American War are buried there. Now, many of the soldiers who were sent to the Philippines were embarked from San Francisco. So in that way, we have that other common history. Uh, when I looked, went up to the Presidio, I couldn't find uh, Funston because I was looking for a big monument and I only found out that he had a very simple monument. It just says that he was a major general in the U.S. Army. He died in 1917. He was a hero of San Francisco. But why is he important? He's important because he was the guy who captured Emilio Aguinaldo in Palanan, Isabela in 1901. Um, and when I was looking for the Funston monument, I wanted to kick it, but there, there were people who were taking me around. But you see that this connection, the beginning of the Spanish-American War happens in Manila Bay. And with the capture of Emilio Aguinaldo, the fighting continued, but uh, it showed uh, America taking on uh, a new colony. Now, before we get into uh, Rizal and San Francisco, I just want to tell you that in other parts of the United States, we have many things that await research and appreciation. Um, this is a photograph I saw in an old book talking about Aguinaldo's family and his relatives. And I looked at this big grainy picture and I couldn't see Aguinaldo in it. And obviously it was taken abroad. But two years ago, when I went on my Centro Rizal tour, I saw a clearer copy in the US Library of Congress in, in Washington. And when I look very, very closely at these people, you will see that this was taken in Paris. Um, and here you will actually see Juan Luna is seated on, on the right. Uh, and in the middle, you actually see Jose Rizal. No, um, this is a picture that people did not know about because they thought it was a picture of Aguinaldo's family. So I'm sure, I mean, I was just going through the library. I only had two days and I found this, which means that if you give me six months, I will probably find much more. After Washington, uh, I proceeded to Chicago in 2019 to visit the Newberry Library, which not many people know, has a very big Filipiniana collection that includes a number of Rizal's actual, actual handwritten diaries and some letters of Jose Rizal. Now, there are people who are asking why this is in Chicago and not in the National Library in Manila. These things were not stolen during the war nor uh, during the American colonial period. These were bought by 
an American collector and were donated to the Newberry Library. And I'd like to think that if these things were in Manila, they might have been destroyed during the war. And now they are very well preserved in Chicago, accessible to anyone uh, who has suitable ID. And I think some of it can even be accessed online. So there is a lot uh, in the United States uh, in our history that can be found if we are willing to look for them and to find connections with them. Now, Rizal's only trip to America was very brief. It was only from April 28 to May 16, 1888. And you know, the other night when I was doing my slides, I decided to open a Google map and just to plot out the points that Rizal actually mentions in his diary. And when I looked at the map, I mean, I was amazed because today, if I travel from San Francisco to New York, I would take a plane. But Rizal went by land and he went through the entire, well, you know, from end to end of the United States to catch a ship. Now, as Conjen mentioned, uh, I also visited the Palace Hotel once. And when I went in, I was so amazed how, how luxurious it was and wondering why Rizal even stayed in, in this hotel. But I will tell you later um, why Rizal usually stays in nice hotels and why he always traveled first class when he was traveling. Uh, there is a marker uh, outside, a very long marker, which most people do not read. and um, we should look at it again and ask ourselves what was the relevance of Rizal's stay then and what was its relevance to us today. Now, Rizal was in San Francisco from April 28 to May 6, but if he actually was on land only for two days, uh, May 4 and 5, before he started on his trip to New York. We actually have his letter to his family where he actually complains because he was kept in quarantine in the boat for almost a week. And this becomes very relevant to us today in the day in, in the age of the pandemic and COVID, where we think about quarantine. No? And, and I mean, if you are coming from the US and you come to the Philippines, you will be quarantined for two weeks. No? So the point here is that suddenly something that was old and irrelevant to us suddenly becomes relevant because of Rizal's experience. Uh, so Rizal writes to his family and he says, you know, they are crazy about quarantine. They have strict customs inspection. They impose tax after tax and it was enormous. Not content with that, he also wrote to his friend Ferdinand Blumentritt and also complained about the U.S. Customs and Immigration Service. So I'd like to think that this first experience of being quarantined, he could see San Francisco, but they were not allowed to disembark. Uh, this colored his entire trip. And so he, since he was so unhappy, he did not write very much. In other diaries, he describes everything, but the short trip to the United States, I think was ruined by his experience of quarantine. What made the experience of quarantine worse was that Rizal wrote that there was going to be elections in 1888 and the officials wanted to show that, you know, we have to protect ourselves against the Chinese. As you know, there was a Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, they didn't want Chinese to come into the U.S. to work uh, and, and live. So again, this thing uh, has resonance to us today in the, in the days where there is some, a very strong anti-Asian bias and some of our countrymen have actually suffered not just uh, verbal but actually physical abuse. Now, in another uh, letter to another friend, he actually exaggerates and says that we were in quarantine for 13 days. Actually, he was only quarantined for six days. But I was amused when I saw that he says afterwards, only the passengers in first class, that includes him, were allowed to land. But those of the second and third class, meaning Japanese and Chinese, remained on board the ship for an indefinite period. So when you go to the Palace Hotel, this is what it looked like in 1887. The Palace Hotel that you see today is already renovated. Uh, there used to be this big interior court, carriages would come in, but today this is a lobby. And, you know, 
when you when you bring your luggage in, you know, even today they'll give you a paper luggage tag. In the past, it was a metal or a brass uh, luggage tag. So Rizal traveled first class not because they could afford it, but I'd like to think that Rizal always traveled first class because it was one way that he would not be prejudiced or at least he would be treated much better than if he stayed in economy. And remember, if you watched um, Titanic, the movie, the, only the people in first class have salvavida and lifeboats. Uh, the people in third class will sink with the ship. So this was a way for Rizal to uh, survive much discrimination. But again, he was very upset by his experience. Now, when I plotted it out, I found out that after two days at the Palace Hotel in San Francisco, May 4 and 5, on May 6, he traveled to Oakland. Uh, he took a ferry to Oakland, and then from there he took a train. And then the train took him to Port Cost Costa, to Benicia. The whole train was placed on, um, on a ferry, no? uh, and then they moved on. And then he had dinner in Sacramento, he slept on the train, and he had breakfast in Nevada on May 7. Now, the interesting thing here is when you read his diary, it's just about him waking up in a new place. So he had dinner in Sacramento, and he woke up in Reno. Uh, after this, uh, he traveled on. Uh, they were in Ogden, Utah by May 8. He changed trains. He mentioned seeing Mormon young men, uh, young Mormon men in Farmington, Utah. They proceeded to Salt Lake City and Provo. And he noted in his diaries that there were more men, more women than men in Utah. And how did he get this conclusion? He says, when I eat in the restaurant, it, we are served by waitresses rather than waiters. So he has many of these little comments while he's traveling. And I wonder what the train sleepers were like in his day. But when he woke up on May 9, he was in Colorado. And he noted with annoyance that the porter of the Pullman car, an American, meaning a white person, was somewhat of a thief. So I think either he asked for a tip or he cheated him in some way. We do not know what that was. Then he mentions that in Colorado, they adjusted their timepieces by an hour. He also noticed that there were more trees in this area of the United States than the three states that he had passed. Then on May 10, he woke up in Nebraska, and by 4 p.m., he was in Omaha. He mentioned the Missouri River that he estimated was, quote, about twice the passing in its widest part. So when Rizal is abroad and describing things, his point of reference is always the Philippines and what he knows uh, from the Philippines. So May 11, he woke up in Chicago, where because the, the departure was in the evening, so this was a transit point, he was able to walk around the city. And Rizal noted while walking around Chicago that every tobacco shop had a statue of an Indian outside. And each of these statues of Indians were always different. So from Chicago, they went to Ontario, not the US side, on May 12. And they stopped at Niagara Falls, uh, which he saw from the Canadian side. And he stood at the foot of the majestic falls and was led to write in his diary, quote, Though, uh, though not as pretty nor as mysteriously beautiful as the falls in Los Baños, it is much more gigantic and imposing that no comparison is possible. They departed that night and he woke up on May 13 in Albany, New York. They passed the Hudson River, uh, which he described as a, a river whose banks are as beautiful, although a little lonely in comparison with the Pasig. And he finally arrived in New York City, uh, stayed in a hotel there, and on May 16, took the second largest ocean liner at the time to take his trip from New York to Liverpool. Now, when you think about it, Rizal was a great traveler. 
about one third of his life, about nine, almost 10 years of his life were spent traveling. So in his, in his old age, uh, he actually said that travel is a caprice in childhood, a passion in youth, a necessity in manhood, and an elegy in old age. When you think about it, Rizal's first trip to Europe was to study. He stayed from 1882 to 1887. The second trip was he came home, but because the Noli Metangere was controversial, he was forced to go back abroad. Uh, and it was on the second trip that Rizal visited the United States. On his first trip in 1882, in his diary, Rizal actually drew from the ship the, the silhouette of Manila. And he describes how it gets smaller and smaller as he gets farther and farther, and then it disappears. But what was important about travel was that Rizal was not traveling for leisure. He was traveling to learn things, to study. And he says that, you know, all modern societies advance because of travel. And so people have gone abroad to search for knowledge. And in terms of Rizal, I'd like to think that Rizal brought of the, studied a lot to bring most of these things back home. So it is unfortunate that Rizal wrote a lot for a nation that does not read him. He left 25 volumes of writing that nobody reads, no, only me. And if you take the time to look at his notebooks, you will find that he has notes on ancient he Egyptian hieroglyphics. He actually has notes on um, in Hebrew. And I was amazed he even started learning to conjugate in Arabic. And of all the words that he started to conjugate, it was the verb matar, meaning to kill. And, and I thought, why was this? And friends who uh, who took Arabic tell me, no, that has no significance. The easiest word to conjugate in Arabic is the word to kill, no, matar. When he went to Japan, uh, he started to try writing also in Japanese. So these words you see here uh, is the word for Nihon, and then he wrote in Spanish, Japon. No? So again, he, he tried to draw. He was a good drawer, uh, but he drew uh, a a Japanese woman in the Japanese style and the characters on the right again uh, tell us Nihon. So Rizal tells us that in his time and even in our times, man is multiplied by the number of languages he possesses. And when he studied in Manila, of course, he knew some Spanish, he had Tagalog from his childhood, and in school he learned Latin and Greek. So when we think that people, Rizal had such many, many, many languages. It was because of his foundation of, in Latin, which made most European languages easy for him to study. Now, this is one long letter that Rizal wrote to Ferdinand Blumentritt when he was in exile in the Pitan. He knew that the uh, Spanish were opening his mail. So he would write in many languages. So you see on the left, he starts in German. And you can see he can write in this 19th century German shrift. Even Germans today cannot write in this handwriting. And it's very difficult to read. On page two, he shifts from German to English. Uh, on page three, he shifts from English into French. On page four, he shifts from French into Spanish. And then on the last page, he shifts uh, to Italian. And he says, please write to me in many languages because I don't want to forget uh, the many languages I learned in Europe. But you must remember that although Rizal was multilingual, he never forgot Tagalog. As a matter of fact, when he traveled to Europe, he carried with him in his luggage a copy of Balagtas Florante at Laura so that he could read it aloud and make his learning of Tagalog even better. Um, Rizal is actually the person who is responsible for the way the, in which we write Tagalog today. You get rid of the letter C, use K, uh, things like that were things that Rizal thought about already in the 19th century. But this last page from his translation of uh, William Tell from the original German to Tagalog, on the last page, he actually even writes out the pre-Hispanic bye-bye-in. No? So 
what you have to see here is while Rizal traveled, unlike most Filipinos who travel, when you travel for the first time for an extended period, you become homesick. You become homesick for family. You miss Philippine food. You miss our weather. And I'd like to think that when Rizal traveled, those nine years that he was traveling, Rizal learned to love his country more when he was abroad. And that made him the hero that he was. But going back to America, Rizal, unfortunately, was not impressed with America. And again, as I told you, we can blame this for his quarantine in San Francisco. And Rizal actually says that he doesn't advise anyone to make a trip to America. And he explains that while visiting the largest cities of America, he realized that America is a great country, but it has many defects. And Rizal actually says, you know, uh, America is a land of promise. Uh, poor people who want to work can better their lives if they come to America. But when he traveled, like when he got to New York, he stayed in this beautiful um, hotel in Fifth Avenue. And I was thinking, you know, um, it would have been, he would have been delighted by New York. But again, Rizal writes in his diary, I was in New York, it was a big city, but there everything is new. And so when you, when you read this, you realize that he was unimpressed because Rizal, Rizal's maturity came about in Europe. Uh, he was practically Spanish. So in a way, he was more European than American. So he missed um, the, the energy and the aggressiveness of a young America because he saw it from the eyes of a European. And um, in his very European cosmopolitan uh, way of thinking, he saw the United States as something that was a bit of an upstart. But the most important thing, and I think what makes Rizal relevant in our day, is not so much the pandemic. Um, Rizal mentions in his diary that one of the defects of America was that there is no real civil liberty. And then he noted that in some states, a Black man cannot marry a white woman or vice versa. And then again, in the light of today's anti-Asian um, racial discrimination, he actually says that because of the hatred of the Chinese, other Asians like the Japanese are confused with them and are disliked by ignorant Americans. Um, Rizal actually had Chinese features, but maybe he would have been mistaken for something else, no? like a Latino. But in, in Europe, uh, Rizal also experienced uh, racial discrimination. He, he hated it when he would walk in Spain and the, the children would call him Chino and they would make fun of him. Um, in one museum in Paris, I, I saw a letter. He was looking at Japanese art. And there were some Frenchmen who saw that he was foreign and said, ah, you, you must be a Japanese. And Rizal didn't say he was Filipino. Rizal claimed that he was Japanese. And then he started to explain all the paintings in the room until one of the French people asked, uh, how come you speak our language so well? Um, uh, why, why are you here in, in, in Japan? And then he says, you know, my I'm, I'm from a distinguished family. My, my parents wanted me to learn Western ways, so they sent me to Europe. And then somebody pointed to Japanese characters in the, in the paintings and said, ah, can, you, can you translate these uh, Japanese characters for us? And then Rizal pretended to go to the bathroom and he disappeared. But it's funny that even if he experienced discrimination, sometimes he would pretend to be Chinese. No, they would call themselves in Madrid the Inchicks, or uh, they would go. He would pretend to be Japanese. But what is important also is that in the 19th century, they were Filipinos were called by the derogatory term Indio. But in 1889. Uh, when they were in Paris, they went to the American Pavilion in the World's Fair and they watched the Buffalo Bill Cowboy Show. And when Rizal saw this, it was the usual thing, you know, the cowboys, lasso, they're shooting, then there were Indians there. And um, Rizal said, you know, the Indians are very, very brave and very proud. And so they decided 
in Spanish, they call them the Indios Bravo. So they said, why, why, do, why should we be ashamed of what we are? Why don't we take Indio as a badge of courage and use it for ourselves? And that's why they call themselves the Indios Bravos. It's the same way in which the term Moro, which has a derogatory uh, connotation, um, in the 70s and 80s, they took it as a badge of courage and they established, say, the Moro National Liberation Front. So what was once a derogatory term becomes a badge of pride. So when we think of Rizal's short trip to America uh, and it becomes relevant to us, it shows you how Rizal uh, experienced uh, racial discrimination but was not crushed by it. It made him better. It made him communicate with other cultures because he felt that one way to change racial discrimination is to have mutual understanding. And you do that by getting to know other cultures and also getting to make your culture and your people known, which is what the consulate does, what Centro Rizal does today. So when we think about it, uh, what is this thing about Rizal and quarantine and racial discrimination? it only points to the fact that history does not repeat itself. Uh, it's one of the things that is taught in school that we have to unlearn. History doesn't have a mind of its own. History doesn't have the power to rule us. So history doesn't repeat itself. It is actually people. It is we who repeat it. And we repeat it because we don't know it. So I'd like to think that again, 160 years since Rizal was born, I hope that you will go back and not just think about him as a national hero and forget about him, but actually to try and read the novels uh, first, because when you read the novels of Rizal, read them as literature, enjoy them, and you will see how in these novels Rizal tells us how to be Filipino, what it is to be Filipino. So it is going back to history. Going back to history is finding connections so that the future will not read like the past. So I leave you with a quote from Rizal on history. Please remember that they keep saying, ang hindi marunong lumingon sa pinanggalingan di makakarating sa paroroonan. Uh, that is not by Rizal at all. The same thing as the most quoted line from Rizal uh, sa aking kababata, ang hindi marunong magmahal sa sariling wika, masahol pa sa hayop at malansang isda. That's also not by Rizal. So I'd like to leave you um, with our, a quote from Rizal, which I think is relevant to us today. He said in a, in a play that he wrote, he said, I entered the future carrying a memory of the past. And this is the way that we must take history. We are not imprisoned by history. We take it with us to give us the, you know, the strength and the understanding to cope with the present and to look at the future with hope. Thank you and good morning. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ambet Ocampo for that very informative presentation, lots of um, facts. And uh, now we know that the, the national hero traveled in our area, our consular jurisdictions, no? um, like Utah, um, Colorado, and even Reno nor in northern Nevada. So um, it's also heartening to know that, you know, when he travels, he compares the places he goes to to, to the Philippine areas, Philippine places. No? So before I, I read some of the questions, um, and uh, just a question, um, Dr. Ambet Ocampo. Um, it's about literature, actually. And yeah, um, what you said is, is very true, no? that Rizal, of course, um, authored many books and um, pieces of uh, literature, but um, nobody, you, you know, reads them. So thank you so much for translating this to your very um, uh, readable books. And um, it's fun to, re to read your books now. So um, one question that we got from the chat box is that in regards to Rizal's literature, in how many ways was he an influence to American literary writers? 
Um, well, there's no influence because um, he was not translated until until around nine, the, the late 19th century. Um, we, it's only now that Rizal is available in English from from Penguin Books that Rizal has has garnered a, a bigger audience. Now, uh, they used to say that Rizal was influenced by uh, American literature being Uncle Tom's Cabin, but it seems that also is, is not true. No? Um, but there, there's somebody who, who mentioned that I didn't realize this uh, in the chat. Somebody said that the Olympia, George Dewey's uh, flagship, was actually the same name as one of Rizal's sisters. Now, that's interesting. Um, somebody also said that it's pronou the pronunciation of Niagara. Uh, I mean, we read things in, Span in Spanish, no? like Arkansas, in Fili Filipinos will read as Arkansas. No? Uh, um, and so even that we read it as Niagara. No? So anyway, yes, any other questions, please? There's someone uh, here, Dr. Campos said, um, Jose Rizal had a companion, a Japanese journalist, Wero Techo. I was wondering what that friendship was like. Did they spend time together the whole time during their trip? Okay. Um, there was a uh, Japanese guy who was actually a writer um, who was on the boat, and he only knew Japanese. And so it, Rizal was the one who did the interpreting from him because Rizal learned a little Japanese when he was in Japan. So they spent time together on the trip. And uh, when this, this Japanese went back to Japan, he actually wrote a novel in which the main character is a Rizal character, no? a man from Manila, he was called. So when, when Rizal was in, on the boat, uh, because he could speak, French and German and English. No, um, uh, if, if if it was some educated guy or he meets a priest, uh, they don't understand each other. He, they'd speak in Latin. No, so he was able to converse with with many many people. In one in one trip, this is one of the things that he mentions. It's quite relevant. He was on a ship, and uh, there was a European family that brought back to Europe with them a yaya for their children. And the yaya was Visayan. And Rizal couldn't communicate with her uh, because he only knew Tagalog. And he says, you know, this is a country woman of mine and I cannot communicate because she only knows Visayan and I only know uh, Tagalog. So he, for Rizal, it, it was important to be global. I mean, even before, even before it became popular, uh, to be able to speak many languages, to be open to other cultures. No? Yes, please. Well, except for the time that he, you know, he excused himself not knowing or reading the Japanese characters. No, wala pang Google Translate. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also a question, Dr. Ambet Ocampo. Um, for clarification, po, um, this is from Arnel Perez. Did the quarantine in California, um, is it really a quarantine associated to the cholera outbreak during Rizal's travel in the, the U.S.? Um, the, the, the reason why Rizal was very upset was that uh, the excuse for the quarantine was that uh, they came from an infected port. But the governor of Hong Kong and Japan said uh, our ports are disease free. So there's no reason to quarantine them. And I know they, they traveled all the way from Yokohama to San Francisco. There was no illness aboard. So Rizal says there was no need for the quarantine. And he was wondering, how come the American customs officials will come in? Some people would, uh, American customs officials would actually eat on board the, the boat. So he says there's something else here. So Rizal says it's part of the Chinese exclusion policy. They just wanted to be strict about the Japanese and Chinese who were in the second and third class. Um, he, he also says that, um, Although the people were not allowed to get off, the cargo was allowed to to go to to unload. And he says, you know, because that was worth money, so it's more important uh, to have the goods unloaded rather than the people. So he 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 said that I mean he was very angry, but I think that was part of it. Whether this was really a racial thing, uh, he he thinks that they. They just didn't want the Chinese and the Japanese to land. So this was the excuse. So that's basically how we know. 
Thank you, sir. Um, we have a couple of a uh, few more minutes now. Um, so anyone who would like to ask questions, please do so now. Um, we have greetings from um the Pitan City, Zambanga del Norte. Um, there's someone watching, uh, Edgar Allen, or uh, joining our webinar now. Um uh, from Boston, Massachusetts, Edgar Allen David, um, uh, Luz Bimida Abelarde, uh, Alfredo Conanan. Uh, so they're saying thank you for making them aware, more aware of Dr. Jose Rizal's travel. Um, but just a question, Dr. Ocampo. So in GIST, what was uh, Dr. Jose Rizal, um, what, what left him unimpressed in his travel to the U.S.? Basically, I think because he was a, he was a European, no. Um, so he saw. I mean, even like today, you know, the French look down on on the Americans. I mean, basically, Europeans would look down and see Americans as sort of like you know a revist. So I guess that was the mindset uh, of Risalto. He didn't give America a chance, or he didn't stay long enough uh, for him to actually. Uh, get rid of his initial but again it, it's that no your first first impressions always last i mean if he had had a nice time and he wasn't harassed during quarantine maybe it would have colored you know the and he probably would have stayed longer uh it would have colored the way in which he saw the the u the us no so, okay. um <laughs> yes uh just uh one of the questions here, um, it's more general actually. Um, he says, I would love to hear ideas on how to help stimulate and promote interest of the great and rich history of the Philippines for the current and future generations. I think Dr. Ambit Ocampa is already doing that. But anyway, is there any ideas on how to- Well, well, that's, why, well that's why we established the uh, Central Rizal program so that in certain in certain places you can have a library because I mean Philippine books are hard to get in the United States. I mean my books, uh, while we have ebooks available in Amazon, I mean you can't go into a Borders or Barnes and Noble and find Philippine books. So uh, uh, the Central Rizal's in selected uh, diplomatic posts have a reference library, and depending on the post, they can be as active as they want. Like. Uh, the Central Rizal in Berlin, for example, they one of one of the things that we have now is that the great diaspora. We have many Filipinos who are growing up abroad and growing up foreign. And Rizal actually writes that you know there is um, he Rizal says that when he visits one Luna in in Paris, he would he would uh, hold Luna's son, and then he would say, you know, he's a little Frenchman. He's not a Filipino anymore. And then another time he had a friend uh, in Barcelona who had uh, his, his child, his son baptized, and Rizal said, yes, it's a great, it's, it's nice that your son will grow up in a free country, but we have lost, he is one more European and one Filipino less. No? So uh, we have many children of, of mixed uh, marriages who are growing up, up abroad. They'll never learn Filipino. Uh, so like in Berlin, they would get the children uh, every weekend and they would teach them you know, basic Filipino uh, to remind them uh, of, of part of their roots. And I think for Rizal, that, that is what is important, always uh, going back to your roots. And for many Filipinos, or at least the ones who actually migrated or are traveling through the United States, it is actually when you are abroad that you learn to love your country more. Um, but it is different if you are a Filipino who is born in the of Filipino ancestry and you're born abroad. No? So that's why we have a central result program so that we can keep uh, the Filipino-ness uh, abroad or you know, have a link with, with the Philippines in that way. Thank you, sir. Um, let me read some of the questions on our chat box. Um, going back to Rizal's travel, was there evidence to show if Rizal engaged with the other Filipinos while he was here in the US? Yeah, there's, there's no mention of it. Um, so he only mentions Chinese and uh, Chinese and, and Japanese people. Uh, I guess in, in that time, uh, 
uh, it was rare for Filipinos to travel. I mean, the great uh, migration or for work was already in the early 20th century when people went to Honolulu to work in uh, sugar and pineapple plantations. But in the 19th century, I guess Rizal must have been a bit of uh, an oddity in America because you'll see this obviously not European man, but then he's speaking in European languages. You know, like when he traveled to uh, the, what is now the Czech Republic, a small town called uh, Little Merich, I, I didn't put it in my in my presentation because it's kind of long. He actually signed the town uh, guest book. And uh, when I visited this uh, a few years ago, the mayor brought out the guest book of the town. And you will see Jose Rizal signed his name on, on the town guest book. And they, they showed us newspaper articles that this was the first time these people in this little Austrian town, now a Czech town, ever saw a Filipino. They, they were the first Filipinos they ever saw. So it's quite it's quite interesting that in, in that age he was already traveling and traveling quite a lot no he's very advanced really in his learnings no um dr ocampo another question um from matthew lopez we know that mariano ponce rizal's friend and propagandist do you know that he he met um if he met sun yat sen dr sun yat sen well uh they, well, Sun Yat-sen was in Hong Kong, Rizal was in Hong Kong. They went around the same circles. Um, they knew the same, they had the same friends, but unfortunately they did not meet. It's one of the, it's one of these uh, what ifs, you know, that what would have happened if they had met. Although Jose Rizal's friend, Mariano Ponce, uh, who was also part of La Solidaridad, in the 1900s, uh, 1899, he lived in Yokohama, and Sun Yat-sen uh, would usually visit his house. We, I actually have photographs. When I went to the archives in Yokohama, they showed me, ah, this is Sun Yat-sen and his Japanese friends. And I said, no, those are Filipinos who are wearing Japanese clothes. No, and then Sun Yat-sen is wearing a West Western clothes, which is quite funny. But again, that's a part of our history that most people do not know that uh, we were we bought arms from Japan and because we were at war with America, the US told the Japanese do not export arms to a friendly country. So because we could not export our arms to Aguinaldo's men, Ponce loaned the arms to Sun Yat-sen and they used it uh, to gain China's freedom. So again, our part in the Chinese revolution is that we supplied the arms. So again, it's that, no? we find many, many uh, things if we are willing to, to look. Yes, thank you so much for making these connections. Um, a few more questions um, from Philip Bahada. Uh, when and where did Dr. or Dr. Rizal knew if um, Antonio Morgas um, shows that, that the, the ancient Filipinos had no arm, army and navy with, with artillery of welfare, warfare. Warfare, yeah. Yes. So now actually, um, Rizal actually is the one who gives us the name of Panday Pira. Um, and he says there was this, there was this person in, 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 the, in Manila who would make uh, cannons, no. Um, but he says, you know, we did not. What happened to our? What happened to our civilization? So that's the whole point of of Rizal that he sees the Spanish colonization as the. It's like the Garden of Eden. It was our fall or being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. So for Rizal, you know, before colonization, the Philippines was perfect. It was like paradise, and it got destroyed when colonization and the Spanish came. You know? So that's that's the that's the mindset. But Rizal tried to to think about it. So that's why he wrote he wrote in uh, they studied the Baibayin, you know, the pre-Spanish uh, alphabet. Uh, he didn't write a book about it. He he references it in his letters, but his friends like Pardo de Tavera wrote a man, ma, monograph uh, tracing Sanskrit in Tagalog. Uh, Juan Luna <coughs> sometimes signed with the, the pre the Baibayan characters bu and la which when you think about it means bulan 
which is the Spanish, which is the Ilocano word for moon, which in Spanish is Luna. No, so again, it's that. No, they would they would play uh, around with with this. Okay, and it did did Rizal have an opinion on American democracy? Well, he he had ideas on race. He he felt that America was a land where people who want to work can find work uh, but it had its uh, it had its defects and i mean all countries uh, have their pluses and minuses so uh, results so so both you know, so both but he unfortunately he did not it's it's very strange because results travel diaries are usually very very detailed you know, he mentions what he eats, he mentions what he sees, uh, even the expenses he would draw, but the <clears throat> America trip, there's not almost nothing. And uh, I think maybe, and he would have had time on the train, but when you read the diary, it's always, I woke up in Omaha, I woke up in Chicago. Maybe he was just sleeping on the train or doing, we don't know what he was doing on the train. No, uh, what else? You've, you've mentioned, Dr. Campo, that um, Rizal's travels were mainly, you know, because he has this um, hunger for learning. But um, there's a question here. What's the main purpose of Rizal's travels? And maybe I have an additional question. Um, who funds his travels? Of course, it's, it's his family, right? But, you know, did he, um, did he even um, ask or, or did he even explore how he could fund his travels himself? Or did he? Did he on his own? No, it, uh, it's one of the things that we think about when we think about Filipinos who are traveling. We always envy them because we think they are just enjoying. We think of travel as enjoy. But uh, I mean, when I would travel, when I was in government, they, they usually take it against government people who are traveling. And I say, you know, you don't know what it's like to travel for government. It's actually work. You know? um, and for Rizal, um, we often think that Rizal was three. I mean, he traveled first class, no, but his, his, his allowance uh, wasn't regular. So if you read his letters, he's always sometimes, when is my allowance coming? I'm only eating potatoes. No, uh, And his sister, before he left, his sister gave him a diamond ring and told him, when you need the money, you go to the pawn shop and pawn it. And whenever he needed money, you would see him in his diaries looking at the ring. Will I pawn this? Maybe my money will arrive tomorrow. But uh, the, his ma their money came from their sugar and rice land. Um, and you will see it was very difficult to send the money because there was no online banking. No? So, and there was no pera padala. So what they would do would be somebody leaving Manila on a ship going to Europe, they would make padala. So uh, they would send cash through the waiter in the, in the boat. And sometimes the waiter will just run away with the money. But you see that even in the boat, they didn't only send him cash. They would send him noodles. They sent him bihon. They sent him halayang manga. They sent him bagoong. They sent him embroidered piña hankies. No? So it was really literally padala. But his money... And this is very interesting because Rizal once wrote, uh, Rizal used to be the image model for HSBC because in one letter he, he wrote to his brother Pashano and said, when you send money, you send it through the Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation because their exchange rates are better. So HSBC used that, you know, that see Rizal banked with us, but they what they did not know was that if you read Pashano's reply, he says, no, the rates are not good. I go to Standard Chartered. No, so again, <laughs> Standard Chartered should actually use that. But it shows you also one of the things that's amazing is that the Rizal family was not an ordinary family. Remember, they're based in Calamba, in Laguna. And when Rizal is writing to his brother, they're talking about what about sending our nephews here to study? They should learn. At, uh, learn things, enroll in universities abroad. And this is Pashano Rizal, 1880s, writing to Rizal and telling him, uh, what, is the, what is the international uh, New York price for sugar? And will the, will, will the price of sugar in New York affect my harvest in, in Los Baños? I mean, a farmer today will not 
look at the international price of sugar, but this is 1880s. Your brother is talking in that way. So they, you know, they were really an, an unusual, very well read, very cosmopolitan family, even if it was only Rizal who had studied abroad. Um, they really sent the money for him to go and R Rizal was always guilty that he, he was living off his, his family's uh, wealth. But again, that's why he had to study to bring uh, things back home. Sorry, that's a long answer. <laughs> really impressive. Um, Dr. Ocampo, there's another question. Um, I have two actually. Um, going back to the Battle of Manila Bay. So uh, our consul in um, Oregon uh, is asking, um, uh, Attorney Enrico Tadeo, he said, you mentioned the Battle of Manila Bay, which uh, some historians claim was simply choreographed between the U.S. and Spain, a show for Filipinos to see, was it? The, the, well, they, they, uh, they're confusing two things. No? Uh, the Battle of Manila Bay uh, was actually a mismatch. No? Although they claimed it was the greatest naval victory at the time uh, because they sunk the entire Spanish fleet. But the Spanish fleet, uh, if you read the accounts, were described as floating antiques. They were made of wood. Uh, the, the U.S. ships were metal and they were armored. They run by steam. I mean, the, it was really very bad. No, Manila was not well protected. So they sunk the entire fleet. Uh, the thing that was staged was that you must remember that while George Dewey sunk the Spanish fleet, he did not have the land troops to occupy and take Manila. So he had to wait. He won May 1. Then they sent soldiers from San Francisco. The soldiers only arrived in, in August or late July. So it was only very late, so many months later, that they had the land forces to occupy. Now, the thing here was that Intramuros had, had closed itself off. The Spanish were holed up. And the Filipino, Aguinaldo's forces, just surrounded Intramuros. They cut off water and food supply. So it was only a matter of time when Intramuros would surrender. But what they did was the Spanish talked to the Americans and said, we will surrender to you. We will not surrender to these Pinoys. Because we think when we open the gates of Intramuros, they will massacre all the Spanish and they will, they will loot our homes. Um, so what the Americans and the Spanish did was they agreed that George Dewey would, would go. But actually, the Mani Battle of Manila Bay is not really in Manila Bay as in Rojas Boulevard. It's actually way off in Cavite. But on August 13, 1898, the fall of Manila, George Dewey's fleet went to where the cultural center of the Philippines is now. And then they bombarded Fort San Antonio Abad so that the Spanish will appear like, you know, we resisted and then we surrendered. So they did not want to just surrender. So Dewey bombarded the fort and then Manila surrendered. So that was the, that was the sham uh, battle. But the first one was a real one, even if it was mismatched. In relation to that, sir, um, there's a question. Rizal wrote that the possible foreign power who may be interested in acquiring the Philippines during that time was the, the U.S., did he uh, or did his fellow Filipinos share the same thought? Were there discussions in Spain and the Philippines about the U.S. dream of um, building an empire? That's from John Paul Egalin Abelera. Yeah, actually Rizal was already dead when the Americans came in. Uh, Again, it's it's depend because Rizal wrote so much, so you can choose, you can just get any quote and use it. So, like uh, in his in his essay, futuristic essay, the Philippines within a century, he says that um, America will be interested in the Philippines. I mean, it's it was not really a prediction; it was his understanding of the way in which uh, the the powers were. I mean, Europe was on the wane; America was 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 coming up so he he saw that and he mentioned it he also mentioned in some other uh writing that you know we should think about japan because one day we will have much to do with japan i mean so during the japanese occupation that's what they used see rizal said we will have 
uh, relations together. So uh, Rizal can be used in many ways, especially for diplomacy because he he traveled a lot. But uh, Rizal, Rizal was also, I mean, the whole idea of of America, it has always been a question because when he was living in the Pitan, he opened a little school. And the, the boys in the Pitan were not taught Spanish nor French, they were taught English. So when the Americans came in 1898-99, they found these English-speaking little boys in in the in far off Zamboanga del Norte because they were Rizal students. So uh, I don't know why he taught them English, you no. Know, but uh, he probably felt this was a language that was worth studying uh, in the late 19th century. You know? Yes. Um... I think we'll have uh, our last question. I, I guess, yeah. um, unless may hahabal pa, no? So our last question is, um, his mother was jailed and also known to walk for miles. Does Rizal get his persistence, determination, strength from his mother? So closer look into the personality and the really Rizal as he, you know, his own well, person. That's, yeah. <laughs> That's why, I mean, I have this little doll, it's Sigmund Freud, and we usually think, you know, uh, if Freud were alive, he would ask Rizal, you know, tell me about your mother, you know. Um, but uh, uh, the greatest influence in Rizal's life was really his mother. You know? He says, next to God, mothers are the next best thing. Uh, it's one of the odd things. You know? uh, the Rizal couple were very uh, productive. They had 11 children, you know, two boys and nine girls. Uh, and it's strange that Rizal's father is almost invisible. It's always the mother he's talking about. And it was the mother who ran the store, the mother who, well, kept the household with, with 11 children. No, uh, The father was, I don't know, the father was just there to make children. Uh, the guy in charge of the farm was his elder brother, Pasiano. So we know very little about the father. It's the mother really who was the the big influence on Rizal's life, and actually the one that made him uh, see. Uh, because as you know, the mother was persecuted, so it was also that I think that that inflamed uh, his patriotism and the whole idea of uh, maybe we should not look at Spain as the as our colonial power anymore, and we should you know, take the land of our birth as ours. No, uh, Many people usually say that Rizal was just a reformist. That is not true. Um, you can see from the novels that in the Noli, Rizal killed off Elias because at the time he was reform-minded, but in the Philly, he becomes more radical. So the, the point here is that uh, if Rizal were not shot, maybe we would have seen him. I mean, Rizal actually writes, you know, I'd like things to be reformed. But he says, you know, when we have done all things and uh, Spain does not change, uh, when we when we have exhausted all the means, God will provide us a weapon. And he says, I am not, I have not closed my eyes to violence and armed revolt if it is necessary. So again, it depends. Uh, because he wrote so much, you can use Rizal to be revolutionary, you can use Rizal to be reformist, but I'd like to think that, you know, if Rizal got the reforms, he would not stop there. And that's why they had to shoot him because the, the campaign for reforms, of course, is the first step in eventually separating and becoming independent. And that I think is Rizal's uh, great promise. Thank you so much, sir. We're really enjoying this. Um, so if we could uh, still entertain so, like two more questions, is it okay with you? Um, yeah, okay, two more questions. read from the Facebook, no? Um, there's one question from Mark Magti. By what Rizaliana document in the Newberry Library that you find interesting and what are your impressions and opinions on Rizal's notes on syphilis written in his clinical medical notebook that is kept in the same library? Um, there's also, of course, saying thank you to his, you know, educating us about history and really about Dr. Jose Rizal. Um, related to his experience here in the, in the U.S., um, there's a question. I wonder how Rizal took note of other Asian ethnicities in his trip to America, apart from the Japanese and Chinese. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Well, there's we we have nothing to. Uh, I mean, the, it's it's only a few pages, his uh, diary in the U.S., so I, we cannot speculate because he didn't write. No, um, 
we wish he wrote more no but again we don't know uh, there's there's a slight chance that somewhere somehow maybe the diary that we have is the diary he did not write on but there's another notebook somewhere that that has something i mean like the newberry library when i visited it for the first time in 2000 uh, when i was on a fulbright research grant i was doing something else and uh, the, you know they, the librarians came out oh you're ambet campo you're the result scholar do you know that we have result material here of course i know and then he says do you want to see the result manuals i said no because I know already what that is, you know. I mean, and it shows you what happens when you are proud and you think you know everything. Uh, so I said, no, I don't need to see it. Uh, I know I can tell you what these things are: the letters, the diary, etc. And on my last day, the librarians insisted and said, we insist that you look at these things. And I said, Sige na nga, show it to me. And to my great horror, when I opened Rizal's medical notebook, I know I knew the contents because I have read the transcription. What I didn't know was that there were so many drawings inside. And, and I realized that they were never published because they're anatomical drawings. I said, you know, I thought he was an eye doctor, but you know, they're drawings of penises in different stages. You know? So I said, what is the, he seems to be in the genitourinary ward. You know? And I guess, we, how, how, can, how will people look at results drawings of genitalia no i mean so you cannot put it in a textbook so that's why i realized that um the things that i thought i know i didn't know pala so i uh, on my last trip the 2019 trip i looked at results 1884 diary which which is there his madrid diary again i know the text i brought my text with me and i said i'll just compare notes and i found out that the text that everyone has been using since 1909, a transcription by Retana, is missing many parts because I think you know they're copying it out. Uh, many parts are missing, so I had to copy it out. And when I copied it out, I I saw that uh, we really have to go back and to look into results writing all over again. So that's just the transcription. Sometimes the translation is wrong. The translator is lazy, he will leave out one page. You know? And if you're only reading the English, then you will not know that there's a paragraph missing or a sentence missing that will change the whole way in which we understand it. So I only got that when I when I went to the Newberry Library. And it's not just um, result material. There are all sorts of strange things. You no, know? I mean, uh, I just, just quickly, one of the strangest things that I've seen there was uh, the trial of a, a woman called Adriana Kapukian. You no, know? the name is, is extremely funny, but she was some, somebody who claimed that she could see the end of the world. Uh, so she was investigated as a witch, you no, know? and uh, that's a document that we, we don't we don't really see, you know. Uh, so the Newberry Library is, 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 has a wealth of information that we have not yet uh, even dug up. You know? So I hope many younger historians will find the, the time to, to go to visit you know, the Newberry and also the Library of Congress to see what else uh, lies in there that we do not know about. Really a wealth of information that could be discovered um, by the likes of Dr. Ambet Ocampo. No? Uh, so, sir, um, just last two questions. Does Rizal enjoy what he is doing? Um, I think he's done a lot, but yeah, if you could perhaps um, yeah, describe to us if he did enjoy all of his travels, all of his studies. And uh, a last uh, question. Um, do you think that um, his being a polymath yeah, is underrecognized because of his race and his country. Okay, uh, Rizal, I mean, Filipinos are separated from Rizal and separated from their past because of language. Um, I'm one of the last uh, in my generation that had Spanish in college. That has since disappeared. And uh, I wonder where I had, I had what uh, 12 units of Spanish when I was in college they removed all of that today my students only have three units of Spanish and I said that's useless you'll only learn uno dos tres in three units no and 12 units is enough for you to read uh, my spoken Spanish is very bad um, my French is better but uh, 
it is important that you're able to read because I realized that language opens new worlds to you. you know? When I was teaching in Japan, because I, I cannot read, I can read katakana, I can't read kanji. Um, I realized I would walk into bookstores and I would realize that there was so many books, so much knowledge that was close to me because of language. So Rizal was a polymath because he wanted to learn. And uh, the, the fact that we don't know much about him is simply because we have been separated from him because of language. One of the sad facts of the American colonial period is that uh, they while they taught us English, which was fine, they should have maintained Spanish because, again, today uh, it is more widely spoken than English is. No, so many, many. I mean, if you're in Manila today working as a call center, a Spanish speaker uh, earns much more than an English speaker. So again, you know, we're we're going back. We hated Spain a hundred years ago, but again, in in the modern world, we are learning. Um, that we need to communicate and that we should have not the, the old um, nationalism that we had. We must have an open-minded nationalism, a nationalism like results that is very secure. Uh, you're proud of your country, but also you're also open to the world. No, uh, because there is a nationalism that is xenophobic and likes to close yourself off from all outside influence. We learn from Rizal what it means to be global, to be national and yet to be global because the, the, the borders of the world, nations, uh, their borders are slowly disappearing. We live in a global world. Uh, and Rizal is, is our first real global Filipino uh, and we can learn a lot from his life and from his experience, uh, what it is like to be Filipino and to be global at the same time. Thank you so much, Dr. Acampo. Well said, um, as always, to be global and to be Filipino at the same time. That's uh, That should be our objective. Um, so thank you so much to all our participants for staying on. I know that uh, you've enjoyed, we've all enjoyed this webinar. So thank you so much, Dr. Ambeth Ocampo and to our participants for joining us. We hope to have uh, in-person presentations in the near future. So we'll have more time for discussions. Um, for the closing remarks, um, we have our Deputy Consul General Raquel Arsolano. She served as Executive Director at the Office of the United Nations and International Organizations at DFA Manila. She served as Deputy Consul General in Guam and as Consul General at the Philippine Embassy in Bahrain. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome um, Deputy Consul General Raquel Solano. Thank you, Consul Van. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning to those who are joining us from Manila. I hope that uh, you enjoyed our webinar, which is titled Rizal in San Francisco, Connections in Philippines, U.S. History. Thank you for joining us in this virtual event. On behalf of the Consulate General and Centro Rizal San Francisco, we would like to thank Dr. Ambeth Ocampo for making the connections in our shared history with the United States. Thank you for sharing with us your knowledge and insights on Dr. Jose Rizal's stay in San Francisco and the rest of his trip in the United States. We hope to have more webinars with you, Dr. Ocampo, in the near future. We would also like to thank once again, the National Commission for Culture and Arts for its support to the Centro Rizal San Francisco and our cultural diplomacy initiatives. I hope that you have learned a lot from our webinar and that we all learn from the experiences of our forebears. I hope that we will take these learnings to heart as we continue to foster greater understanding of different cultures and histories, especially our Philippine history and the shared histories of the Philippines and the United States amid the many uncertainties that we are currently facing. Maraming salamat po at mabuhay tayong lahat.